My name is Bongani Majola. I am the registrar of the ICTR. The role of the registrar is to support um, the organs of the tribunal, both the judges, the chambers, as well as the office of the prosecutor, by providing the services that they need in order to be able to do their own work according to the mandate that the Security Council has given to uh, the tribunal. Um, the role involves, of course, um, providing the staff, um, doing things like the recruitment and so on. Or more generally, the registrar is the, the chief administrative officer of the tribunal because his job is to actually make sure that all the administrative services or activities are attended to which are needed to support the judicial activities of the, of the court. In this case um, uh, of the ICDR, the registrar's role includes, among other things, uh, the recruitment of staff that will be needed by his own office, but by also uh, the office of the prosecutor and those that are required for supporting the judges uh, in the execution of their duties. Uh, similarly, uh, the registrar is responsible as a, an accounting officer you know, for managing the finances of the, of the tribunal. Um, also, the registrar has the mandate of the Secretary General and therefore acts as the public face of the tribunal and um, uh, represents the Secretary General um, to the outside world, outside of the, of, of, of the tribunal. That, that's generally the crux of it. With regard to the, the, the trials and the appeals, the registrar then provides the system of court management to enable the courts to function. The, the role of a registrar, or the job of a registrar of the ICTR um, has similarities to the role of a registrar or, uh, in a national setting. However, there are vast differences. For example, um, the registrar at the national setting, of course, supports the court processes. Um, similarly, the ICTR registrar also supports uh, court processes by, um, you know, um, um, receiving the filings that the parties do and making sure that they are served on the other party. That happens in a national setting. The difference also, however, is that at a national level, uh, the registrar has much more limited powers compared to the ICTR. At the ICTR level, you also uh, have the uh, duties that I've mentioned of um, uh, representing the Secretary General, that of uh, um, uh, hiring uh, uh, staff, um, being a diplomat with regard to the outside world, with regard to uh, um, member states, and, and so on, on behalf of the uh, of, of of the of the tribunal. Uh, in a national setting, you will find that the registrar plays a bigger role in a civil uh, in civil proceedings. Here, um, the registrar play, plays quite a, a significant role in in a criminal settings in a criminal setting which is not usual in a, uh, a, a national uh, jurisdiction. Usually in a national uh, jurisdiction, you find that it is the prosecutor that plays the dominant role. In the um, international setting, the ICTR, you find the registrar playing the role that is played by the police, that is played by the uh, correctional services uh, people uh, within the national setting. Here, um, we, 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 we uh, do quite a lot of work that um, is done by those law enforcement agencies. Without witnesses, the uh, judicial processes cannot go on because uh, whatever the judges do is based on evidence, and evidence 
is brought to the judges by way of witnesses in those cases. So the challenges have been vast. Um, number one, the witnesses that were required for our trials, uh, for the prosecution, most of them came from Rwanda. Um, and, and so the challenges were to get them from Rwanda and bring them here. Uh, most of them didn't have identity do document, documents. Many of them have never, had never been in, a, in an aeroplane. And um, it, was, it was a challenge initially to try and convince them that they could fly. But more seriously, the, the problems with the, the witnesses from Rwanda were that um, many of them were sick. Many of them were left with nothing after the genocide, you know. Um, and they, they saw the conditions under which the, 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 the detainees were kept here. They were given food every day, three meals a day. They had free medical services. They were given clothing. They were given all kinds of amenities. And this created a great deal of um, um, difficulties for the registrar in the sense that the victims' organizations like Ibuka and Avega and others said, why should witnesses go all the way from Rwanda to Arusha to testify there when the tribunal is doing nothing for them? When they are sick, they are not given anything. Yet the people who actually caused them all this misery are being fed, they are transported around, they are clothed, and so on and so on. There is something wrong with the, um, with, with the, the, the system at the tribunal. And, and they then encouraged their members not to cooperate with the, the tribunal. But the problem with witnesses is wider than that. Defense witnesses um, were, were out in the diaspora. They fled Rwanda. And some, many of them didn't have papers. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Many of them, of course, became refugees wherever they were. And many of them were under the impression that the Rwandan government was looking for them in order to prosecute them for whatever allegations against them uh, in respect of the genocide. And they were therefore hiding or afraid to come out because they feared that by coming out, it would be known to the Rwandan where they live and that they could then be picked up. Uh, some, I recall that at some stage, some witnesses were not willing to come because they were saying that they have been informed that the Rwandan agents were waiting to pick them up as soon as they get to Tanzania or as soon as they leave Tanzania and so on. And the difficulty, therefore, was how do we bring them here? How do we take them back? Uh, we had to provide escorts to go and pick, pick them up and, and to take them back. There were legal problems also that required di diplomatic interventions by the registrar, namely to uh, speak with the uh, uh, authorities of the country where they were for two reasons. One, uh, to ask whether they, those authorities could assist uh, with uh, um, documentation. But in cases where people were refugees, um, they feared that if they left, they would lose their uh, status or even when they were not refugees, but were there illegally, they feared that once they leave, the country would say, you cannot come back. And so we had to negotiate that they could transit from wherever they are, they were to, to Arusha, and that they should go back and be accepted uh, without any, any problem for them. But those who really felt very vulnerable after coming here, the challenge was to say to them, all right, we will try to relocate you to somewhere else. And, and that also required a lot of um, um, negotiations on the part of the registrar with foreign uh, states to ask them to accept these people after they had come here to, to testify. Um, the uh, witnesses were sickly. Some of them came here and um, they needed medical attention. They couldn't testify and so on. So the uh, registrar had to provide medical support to them and psychological support uh, to, to the witnesses. Yeah.
Yes, I, I think this was an anomalous situation. Usually, when a person has committed a crime, the, the, the trial usually takes place not very far from the community um, which has been wronged by the, the, the crime in question. And so the Rwandan victims of the genocide were also keen to know what happened to the uh, people who uh, violated their rights. Uh, unfortunately, you know, for political reasons, the court ended up here. Um, and that therefore created the uh, situation where the witnesses would never see or know what was happening. Uh, the Security Council in, in, in establishing the tribunal had clearly said that they feel that these people must be punished and that this must come to an end. And then they said they are convinced that if these people are punished, it would contribute to reconciliation, national reconciliation in Rwanda, and that it would also contribute to, to peace. And that presupposes that the people who were wronged by the genocide had to see what was happening because you cannot reconcile unless you know that justice has been done. Um, so in order to bridge the gap, we looked at various factors. One of the factors was that Rwanda, you know, has got a huge uh, rural, rural population, which some of which didn't have access to, to radio, and uh, the, there was poor newspaper uh, media, television, and, and, and so on. Um, however, <coughs> we decided that we were going to create a press office down here. And that press office was uh, populated on an ongoing basis by journalists from many uh, language uh, uh, backgrounds, but included journalists that came from Rwanda in the hope that the daily reporting that they would do on the daily activities in court would also be reported in Rwanda, hopefully in the language that many of the people were able to uh, understand or to, to, to read in, in Rwanda, namely Kenya, Rwanda. Uh, we uh, had uh, ongoing press briefings uh, on what was going on. Our website also was reporting on an ongoing basis, unfortunately, in, 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 in English mostly, uh, not in, in Kenya, Rwanda. Um, However, in order to bridge this gap, we, we then also created something, some outreach uh, 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 project. And that outreach project aimed at beaming, for example, the judgments. When a judgment was, was, uh, was delivered, it, it would make sure that ju that judgment is reflected in the media in, in, um, in, in, uh, in, in Rwanda. In, French and English and in Kenya, Rwanda, uh, what the tribunal would do would actually pay to bring uh, journalists who uh, work in those media, in those languages, to Arusha to attend the uh, judgment delivery, to ask whatever questions, to get whatever information they needed in order for them to write for publication in their newspapers uh, or, or, or radios in, in, in Rwanda with the uh, aim of trying to reach the, the population in Rwanda. But we also decided that not everybody will be listening to radio or reading the newspapers, and we decided to establish an information center which is called the Musanzo Center, uh, at which we were going to deposit, you know, the um, records of the judicial activities of the tribunal so that people could access that um, and, and read whatever was, was going on. We tried to send uh, as, as current information as possible to, uh, to the Umusanzu Center. Fortunately for us, it actually uh, caught up and became very successful to the extent that at a later stage, it was decided to establish other mini -sen information centers in the um, 10 provinces of, of Rwanda. And those have actually also worked well. They have been um, patronized by um, uh, university professors and students. They've been patronized by high school children. They have been patronized by judges, magistrates, uh, academics, and, 
and even foreigners who come to Rwanda and do research and so on have found a useful resource uh, in, uh, in, in the form of these uh, uh, Umusanzu centers. It is not adequate. Uh, it is not as, as uh, the same as, you know, um, having broadcasts in the language in which the people, you know, understand. But we believe that it actually served the purpose for which uh, we, we had uh, established it. Well, there, there have been many challenges that we have faced, um, uh, each one big in its own way. Um, one of the challenges that I could, I could uh, mention is that this tribunal was one of the two experimental tribunals that were created by the member states uh, to see whether international criminal uh, justice is possible. And as such, they had no precedence in many cases. How to bring witnesses? Um, they had no precedence on how to detain uh, accused persons in a situation of an underdeveloped country which does not have detention facilities that meet international standards and so on. And so those were challenges, how do we do it? Um, uh, court management was, was an issue. And one of the challenges that uh, we had, of course, is that the International Criminal Tribunal brought people from different parts of the world, from different backgrounds, speaking different languages, and all the way to converge in a court of law and try to talk about what happened in Rwanda, um, tell the accused that he is accused of this and that and that, and listen to him speaking in whatever language that he was speaking. And the challenge was to make this possible for um, uh, the, the, the court to function. And the registrar was required then to provide language services to support the uh, judicial activities. Uh, there was a scarcity, of course, of people who um, speak all these languages. And so the challenge was to try and source people that could do interpretation and translation. Um, as the court expanded, of course, there was a big demand for this. Uh, there were uh, the European Union and, and many other entities who, which also required or needed uh, interpretation services. But there was also a, sp a specific challenge, namely that it is, it, is, it is easy to do translation, you know, of just ordinary text, but it requires more skill to translate legal text. Um, and, and there was a shortage of that. And so the uh, Office of the Registrar had to find a way around that. And um, we did a lot of training of, of people. We recruited people from outside. We subjected them to training as interpreters, as, as, as translators, even as revisers, uh, in order to produce the required uh, um, uh, um, volume or number of, of people. In the process, of course, the uh, member states uh, in the form of the Security Council and the General Assembly were complaining that the proceedings were, were, were going very slowly uh, because of the translation that was being done. So the registrar had to improvise and, and introduce what is called simultaneous translation and retrain uh, it's 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 uh, uh, interpreters. Uh, sorry, we had to in introduce a simultaneous interpretation, not translation, and we had to uh, retrain um, most of our interpreters on simultaneous uh, uh, interpretation. Similarly, the challenge was the recording of the evidence that was given in court. We had court reporters helping us. Uh, to do that, and, and we had also to train them uh, on um, uh, uh, producing these, uh, the transcripts uh, instantaneously. In other words, uh, what I'm saying is that sometimes a trial would, would be delayed in the morning because the defense counsel will stand up and say, yes, I heard the witness testify yesterday, but I don't have a copy of everything the witness said. I need then to wait until a transcript is made, 
so that I can look at it and then formulate all the questions that I need to formulate. So in order to, um, to remove that problem, we had to come with a plan of um, uh, uh, producing this transcript within a short period of time. And we looked for software. Fortunately, we got something called Live Note, uh, which was then introduced, and the uh, stenographers, uh, court reporters, and so on, were trained on using that so that when the evidence was given today, by morning, tomorrow, the lawyers and the prosecutors all had the rough transcript and they could go on with, the, um, with, the, uh, with, with their, their work. We, we have had many other challenges, but one challenge that I'd like to mention, which still uh, lingers, is the challenge of uh, dealing with people that get, uh, got acquitted by the tribunal. It is, it is a huge challenge and it will outlive the, the ICTR. Um, many people who were acquitted are still in Arusha and they still do not enjoy their liberty because once acquitted they didn't have anywhere to go. They couldn't go back to where they were arrested because they were there illegally in any case and those countries don't want to take them back. They cannot settle in Tanzania because Tanzania had offered the uh, location for the court but not to accept people to come and settle here. They cannot go to Rwanda because they say they are afraid that they will be prosecuted again in Rwanda. Um, and, and so they are stuck in, in, in Arusha. And, and cannot go anywhere. And we, the registrar has crisscrossed uh, this continent, uh, Europe and other places, to try and find countries that would be willing to accept them. We've even gone to countries where these people have got close relatives, like children who have become citizens of those countries. Uh, and we have not been able, by and large, to get those countries or any of these countries that we've gone to, to accept them. And um, the challenge is that, you know, everybody feels that we should fight impunity. Everybody feels that, um, you know, people who commit these bad things have to be prosecuted and so on. But the anomaly is that people who are found, therefore, to be innocent get punished much more than those that are found guilty. Among the people whom we have prosecuted here and found, I mean, and prosecuted here, some that were found guilty are now free because they served their sentences and left. Those that were acquitted at the same time or even before them are still stuck here in semi-detention in, in, in Arusha. I think this, this is, is one of the biggest challenges that the, um, the registrar has had. We've reported the matter to the Security Council and to date the Security Council has issued three resolutions calling upon member states to uh, assist by resettling these people. Uh, and all those resolutions have not had the desired effect. You know, um, so the, the problem goes on. Well, the legacy of the Office of the Registrar is um, one, the, the outreach project that we had in, 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 um, in Rwanda. The ICTR is going to disappear, but that project is going to go on. Um, uh, not only the uh, academics, uh, but people from outside Rwanda think that it's a great project. Uh, the Rwandan government has agreed to take it over because uh, they feel that it has been of such assistance to them um, and that it's such a useful uh, um, a project for them. It's both outreach, it's both resource, you know, um, and, and, and it, it, it is helping the development of the country in one way or, or, or another. The other legacy of the Office of the Registrar is of course the language uh, um, legacy in the sense that um, we have uh, developed um, the language abilities of many uh, young men and women, especially in this continent, and enable them not only to do uh, interpretation and translation, but also uh, to do interpretation and translation of legal texts, text, which is a lot more difficult 
than uh, uh, ordinary uh, text that, that, that uh, you know, you, you, you developed. When we started, there was no um, precedent on how you uh, manage witnesses. We have established programs, uh, or a, a program on witness uh, uh, management and witness protection, and um, that program we have had to go to we have been invited by other countries to actually go and, and train their staff on witness management and we still get called up to today. Similarly on court management, we've, we've been invited by um, countries here um, in Africa and elsewhere. We've been as far as the Caribbean where we have uh, gone to do training on, on court management, which are all products that were homegrown in the registry of uh, the, the, the ICTR. The ICTR found itself in an under, underdeveloped country uh, and it has also had to work with underdeveloped countries. Um, and we, we didn't have in those countries, detention facilities that meet international standards. Uh, so we had to introduce them and build them ourselves. And so these remain legacies in those countries like Tanzania, Mali, um, Benin, and now we're going to do uh, one in, um, in, 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 in Senegal. And, and those um, we, we, we think are going to actually pull the country towards um, uh, reaching those standards generally in, 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 in its uh, um, uh, uh, prison uh, system. Well, I do understand the criticism because um, it is based on a national um, system paradigm. However, I do not agree that it's been too expensive. I, I think that the expense invested relates very well to the objectives. When the ICTR was created and the ICTY, when the two were created, there, were, there was no certainty whether international criminal justice can work. Yet there was a huge problem with impunity and many people being killed, abused, and so on and so on and so on. So the, the, the issue was how do we contain this problem? Um, you couldn't use a national setting in order to do that. Certainly the genocide in Rwanda had um, uh, destroyed the judicial system. So. Um, if, if the ICTR was not created, uh, the price that we would have paid is that people like Kambanda, like Bagosora, and many others would probably still be free today after the, uh, the, the horrendous crimes that they committed. Um, by creating the ICTR, we made it possible to hold those leaders to account and some of them are serving life in, 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 in prison. And this sends out a message that, um, you know, you will be called to account no matter who you are. So the, the ICTR is different from a national system which has got its own police force, the army, and so on. We do not have those. Number two, the national system uses national people who, who are local. We have had to call people from different parts of the world, speaking different languages, from different legal systems and backgrounds, and we've had to try and make these people work together in order to achieve what the Security Council, what the member states wanted to do. And um, bringing those people from far and wide is expensive. Uh, however, I have spoken about the witnesses, bringing the witnesses from all parts of the world and ensuring their safety and, and so on is also expensive. We had to look for these accused persons. They were not just within the country for us to go and grab and 
but they were far away. Some of them had government uh, um, um, agencies, you know, protecting them, making it difficult to, to, um, to arrest them, to track them and, and to arrest them. Some of them are still at large up to now. And all this um, uh, requires money. Uh, you know, investigators have to fly around, stay somewhere, eat something, you know, uh, buy information sometimes and so on. Prosecutors have to go and, and so on. And so, so all these are not there in a national system. And so a person who looks at a national system and looks at this then says, oh, but the amount of money that you have used is so much. If you had given it to us uh, in the national system, we would have done more. Yes, because you, 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 your system has got all these support structures already, and so you do not have to spend money on them. The international criminal justice system doesn't have, and so it has to pay for them. However, I think that the amount that has been invested has made a message, has brought people who would otherwise have escaped justice, has um, um, given assurance to victims that people who do this uh, are, can be called to, to, to account. And we think, therefore, that the amount is justified by what has been done.